Welcome everybody. I would like to be begin my talk to you today by respectively acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians, the Warrenjeri people of the Kulin Nation, of the land now known as Melbourne, on which we gather today to celebrate the opening of Michael's exhibition. And I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Can I say I'm delighted to be here today to, and thank you Lorraine for asking me and for Michael for asking me to open your exhibition. And I do have to declare a very strong interest with Michael. Um, Lorraine spoke of 20 years together exhibiting with Michael and I think it's 30 years that since Michael and I first met when I came to Launceston to take up my position at the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery. And it's funny how we were just talking before about how quickly time goes and you just say, oh, 30 years, gone, bing. But um, it's been a very interesting and, <coughs> and delightful association with Michael over that time. And I guess I've been quietly observing the evolution of his work over that period of time, with each exhibition being eagerly anticipated. And I have greatly valued the time um, that I've spent in his studio having a sneak preview, which really has been a wonderful privilege. Michael's painting continues a very long line of artists who have observed, responded to and interpreted the Tasmanian landscape and its environment. And the paintings you see here today are intricate, they're rich, with a very complex tapestry of nuanced colours, detail and importantly meaning. They demonstrate, as you will see, a very close attention to detail, in fact an extraordinary attention to detail, with the result of an artist's very keen eye, finely honed to capture this extraordinary documentary detail that each work contains. And perhaps less obviously, they carry the artist's hopes. And I'll speak more of that later. The earliest responses to Van Diemen's land, to sightings and to its unique environment can be summarised as those of awe. A quote from Jacques de Balladier, the naturalist on the 1792 exhibition under French Rear Admiral Bruni d'Entrecasteaux, gives us some insight into a late 18th century attempt to classify and understand the natural world, particularly these newly discovered natural worlds, or new to, to European eyes. And I, I quote, We were filled with admiration at the sight of these ancient forests, in which the sound of the axe had yet never been heard. The eye was astonished in contemplating the tremendous size of the trees, amongst which there were some myrtles more than 150 feet in height. The most luxurious vegetation is here contrasted with its final dissolution and presents to the mind a striking picture of the operations of nature, who, left to herself, only destroys in order that she may recreate. For the Aboriginal peoples of Tasmania, the island was both home and universe, a paradise before British occupation, that provided all the resources necessary for sustaining their life and an environment that could be managed, particularly for their food sources. <coughs> this greatly contrasts um, when we look back at the historical story of the occupation of Tasmania with the attitudes of the British colonists, who regarded the island's resources very much as commodities for commerce and exploitation that very much, I believe, set in train debates that still resonate in Tasmania today about the use of natural resources, areas that should remain natural and in there, in there as pristine as possible, and those that should be opened up and expanded. It's still a very active debate today. Many of the stunning pieces of Tasmanian antique and contemporary artists' furniture have their origins in these ancient forests. So the first view that I quoted was, I guess, very much an acknowledgement of an Antipodean paradise. And the second was a recognition of a resource with the potential to be harvested and consumed. 
It's very easy to summarise those ideas simply, but they're very complex and difficult often to resolve. So you may wonder why I've taken this approach to the introduction and what relevance it has to Michael and his work that we're here to celebrate today. Whilst driving out to Michael's studio last week to have my privileged preview, which I greatly treasure, um, to see his works before they were packed and shipped off to, to Melbourne here, my attention was caught by the particular quality of the late afternoon's raking light on the landscape, its angle, and on the farmland, particularly, especially on the paddocks with their clumps of introduced species, the dreadful scourge of gauze that is spreading across um, native forests as well as very um, useful agricultural lands. And the rising trees and shrubs, the shrubs behind. And it just struck me, I was driving through one of Michael's paintings. And it was through a country that may not rate a second glance by most drivers gave him through, that gave me very much a sense of familiarity, but also anticipation about what I was shortly to view in Michael's studio. On the return journey, there's a point where the mountains of the east appear on the horizon and they stretch from Ben Lomond to Mount Arthur. And it's, at this time of year, they have a wonderful lacing of snow and that's gradually becoming heavier. And as that snow um, increases, their, their presence turns to quite a regal impact on the landscape. And the grey-green of the forested hills in the foreground and then flowing through in layers, which you can also see and observe in Michael's um, paintings, moving from the olivine greens and through to virtually grey, is very much that landscape that I also fortunately view every day when I sit in my garden and I look to those mountains to the east. And it's what I observed in Michael, have observed in Michael's paintings previously and also in the group that are here today. And for, I was just passing through that landscape, but for Michael, he doesn't, it's not something he just passes through. It's his home he's lived in since his childhood in Longford in the early 60s. And in Rob Nick James's a very intuitive and informative essay in the exhibition I commend to you to read, Rodney suggests that Longford must have seemed like a paradise on earth for a young kid growing up in Tasmania in the early 1960s. Michael lived both an urban and a rural existence in Longford, surrounded by neatly organised farms and domesticated animals, but also with easy access to the wilder parts of that landscape. Just behind Longford are the Great Western Tiers, um, a mammoth collection of mountain bluffs that stretch northwest and form a barrier uh, to the um, Central Highlands Plateau and, the, and from the lower inhabited valleys of the Midlands. And to the east are the ranges that I spoke of before. With heavily forested slopes, they appear dark and ominous. The surrounding landscapes have also inspired many other artists, both historical and contemporary. And Michael would have also had the opportunity to view particularly some of these historical paintings, some in local museums, others perhaps in home, um, as, as he was growing up. So I think that I'm correct in assuming that there was that early exposure to these extraordinary interpretations of the Tasmanian landscape. And the landscape that Michael would have experienced growing up and still does is not just one of the of trees and land, but also of the animals that inhabit that. And they are animal species that he's grown to know, to understand and to cherish. Michael's father was a skin merchant before developing the well-known known Longford Antiques that now Michael and his partner Robert manage. So Michael would have been exposed very early on to the results of harvesting native species. Tasmania has three um, species of macropods, 
excuse me, <coughs> on which the forest kangaroo is the largest, the Bennett's wallaby, which we will see depicted in many of the paintings here, and the exquisite, delicate, beautiful paddy melon, which you will observe in the painting just on the wall behind us. And like those animals, possums, sugar gliders, platypi, spotted tail quolls, and in the early years, the Tasmanian tiger were all hunted and collected for their worth as skins, for transformation into rugs, coats, and other various items of human consumption. So the realities of life and death for the animal kingdom would have been very apparent to Michael in those early years. Lorraine mentioned my time at QB Mag, and I recall as my uh, during that time, I acquired for the collection a platypus, platypus rug made in the late 19th century. And it was an exquisite object, the fur still very intact and beautiful, simply designed and constructed to perform the function of providing warmth and protection for its owner. But the irony of this thought came to me as I realised that I was referring to its human owner. I stopped and closely examined the individual pelts that made up the rug, which totaled, totaled about 60 platypi, for whom the function of warmth and protection of their fur was no longer there, and nor were they. Now to focus on the subject of this exhibition, the wallaby, which you'll see in both humorous and quite delightful positions all through the painting. And I'll simply refer to the wallaby as part of the broader family of the kangaroo. And I know I'm taking a bit of natural science license here, but you may call this my creative license. For the indigenous peoples of Australia, the kangaroo is depicted in ancient rock paintings and contemporary bark paintings. And it's both a spiritual and a totemic animal and is represented and interpreted, and that continues today. The kangaroo is one of our most recognisable symbols. It's been featured on the coats of arms, in motifs, in architecture and design, um, in ceramics, in three-dimensional form. It's the subject of songs, ballads, poems. And who doesn't recognise the kangaroo symbol on the tail of Qantas Plains? It's, it's, it's very much a national icon. It was originally considered an oddity, and a unique animal when painted by George Stubbs after the 1771 exhibition where Stubbs was commissioned by Sir George Banks to, to paint the kangaroo. And it's been appearing in exhibitions and displays ever since then. However, it took a long time for it to be officially recognised and it wasn't until 1908 when it became um, uh, part of the official coat of arms. So the kangaroo, the wallaby and their various cousins have continued to provide um, to be an animal for human consumption, both for their meat and their skins. They're also shot as pests. So when we look on the one hand of its, the kangaroo and its relative's role as part of our national identity and they're also for human consumption and the third scenario that they're considered pests and shot and destroyed, how do we truly value the animal? How do we value the kangaroo? Do we value it? And these are some of the questions that Michael asks us to consider when we are looking at his paintings. How we value animals, and in particular our endemic animals, is a core question at the heart of this exhibition. And with increasing pressure from human populations, on for natural resources and land, animals regularly come off second best, best. They have no voice unless we give them a voice. And that is something that Michael has attempted very courageously and I think very well to do within the works in this exhibition. Not just this exhibition, but many of his previous works as well. We don't tolerate torture or ill use between humans but we allow or accept it with native and domesticated animals. We accept the depiction of dead animals in art and marvel at the skill of the artist in depicting their demise. But do we question their deaths? 
I will be to think of that. Many of the um, characters in Michael's painting, and I'll call them characters, because one thing Michael does is give these animals an identity. <coughs> Along with his beloved pets, or the domesticated animals that we see, the rural animals represented in his paintings, you'll notice in the titles they're often named. It's very hard to actually eat or wear an animal once you've named it. I think, I think you'd agree with that. <coughs> There's often a challenge to spot the animals in Michael's paintings, and I think this is a deliberate ploy to draw you into the works to look a little bit closer, a lot closer. He has an engaging sense of humour that's reflected in the titles of the works and often in the positioning of the animals and depiction of the animals. And sometimes the individual elements in a painting will take you quite by surprise. But I don't think we can say that Michael's works are fey or innocent, far from it. His work has won him numerous national prizes, including the Glover Prize, the Wind Prize, the Waterhouse Natural History Prize, and he's achieved national recognition. And I'd like to think that the depiction of, depiction of the animals in Michael's paintings comes from his close observation of them. You cannot paint fur, for example, on the paddy melon in the painting entitled Keeping Up Appearances and not intimately be aware of and know the animal you are painting. Each hair appears as if it's been painted with a brush comprising only of a single cat's whisker. And I have to confess that I do collect these whiskers from around <coughs> my house for this purpose. I haven't yet given them to Michael. <laughs> he is a very astute observer and his ability to recreate these observations onto the canvas is recognised and celebrated. You've listened patiently to my words and I thank you for this. Now I would like you to take some time to look closely at each of Michael's work and understand, come to understand the ideas behind them. They're not always obvious and sometimes, they, as I mentioned, they're quirky or they're humorous and the title may give you a hint. However, through these close observations, the works reveal themselves. As you were looking at the paintings, I would like you to reflect on the eloquent words of the artist himself. This exhibition takes a gentler approach to highlighting the plight of animals on our dominion of the planet. My aim is to make us to think carefully about our connection and our relationship with animals. Perhaps people seeing these paintings will reflect on animals, an animal and its life and develop respect and appreciation for the welfare of animals. By drawing attention to the physical and emotional well-being of the animal, the exhibition also raises questions about the extent to which we are prepared to go to protect the environment in which they live. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you for sharing your vision of an alternative Eden, and I commend this exhibition to you all. Thank you.